So uh, this is my testing box. So before we get started with the talk, all of these ideas are a methodology on how to do recon. Um, now, I have, with basically bubblegum and popsicle sticks, stitched this together into some automation, just bash scripting, right? Um, a lot of this stuff can be done automatedly. Some of it takes like kind of contextual knowledge, but most of it can be automated. Um, so we're going to choose uh, one of two targets. Both have bug bounties and bug crowd. I'm not doing anything illegal um, that to enumerate while we're doing the talk. So you have your choice of Twitch.tv or Tesla. Who wants Twitch? Twitch? OK, who wants Tesla? OK, Twitch is the winner. <laughs> All right. So let me start this up. And this takes a while to run, so. All right. So this is literally my script I use when I'm red teaming or bug, or bug bounty hunting. And so we're going to go through the talk and the output. But this takes a little while to run. Hopefully, it'll be done by the end of the talk. OK, Emergent Recon. already did the intro. Um, the only thing I will say additionally is that I'm a dad. I love my kids. Uh, and that's my girl winning, well, not winning, but solving her first CTF challenges at uh, OWASP CTF in Santa Barbara. Uh, so really proud of her there. Uh, I'm also a huge gamer. I play a whole bunch of games. So you can probably socially enumerate my uh, battle tag or something like that and add me on Steam or uh, WoW or whatever I play. So, All right, the first section, discovering IP space. So one of the methods I use to discover IP space is keyword searching by organization. Now, these slides show Tesla, but the tool that we're running, we're going to do Twitch. Um, so the best place to do this searching for what's called an autonomous system number is this site called bgp.he.net. Um, the, reason, the reason you want to find autonomous systems number, right? If you're a large enough organization and you run your own network, uh, really the, the internet's not globally connected computers. It's globally connected little networks. Well, not little at all. They're very large. They're called autonomous systems. When you have a large enough system or network, you have to register it. And so when you register it, you have to register a description or a name of your company. This is one of the only sites that allows you to search keywords to match company names to autonomous system numbers. So here you have Tesla Motors, and you can see their starting registered IP space on the right-hand side there, that 209-133-709-024, Tesla Motors, Inc. Now what's awesome about keyword searching for this type of data is basically uh, they might have registered another autonomous system number under a different entity name. And so here, you can also see on the left-hand side that searching for just Tesla also came back with Tesla Engineering Group. Uh, so they might have a different autonomous system that I want to enumerate for a wide scope bounty. So then there's always your, your verbatim registries, right? Aaron and Wright. These have uh, who is data, reverse who is data on anybody. They both have web services that will allow you to do keyword searches on things like Twitch or Tesla or whoever. Um, this will start giving you back IP space that you can start adding to uh, basically your list of things that you're going to hack. All of this goes around building a list of things you want to hack in your red teaming engagement or your bug bounty hunting. So someone said Shodan earlier. Shodan also allows you to search by the organization tag. So here you can say org colon Tesla plus motors. You can also search just by keyword Tesla, but you'll get a lot more, re more results. This will start giving you everything that Shodan has given you. What Shodan is, it's an internet spider um, that goes a little bit deeper and has indexes and is available to hackers. Um, it'll basically profile technology, stack, IP information, certificate information, a little bit deeper than any regular spider goes. And it keeps it in this large database that you can query for almost free. And even the paid version is really not that expensive for, for Shodan. Um, so here you can search Tesla Motors in this instance and find out that there's a whole bunch of systems already out there. Um, you can also search for title. This parses out title, which can be really useful because if you're looking for a specific type of device or technology that they might have on their network that's vulnerable, uh, you'll see it right away in, in the Shodan search results. So this is a little stopping place. And I actually don't really show this very much, but I don't because it's not really hacking. But it's super useful for me when I'm doing this large base recon on a site like Twitch. Um, so I organize all my testing uh, inside of mind maps. And you could do this inside of an Excel spreadsheet or OneNote or something like that. But I use XMind. And uh, I thought I'd just kind of show you how this works out. So here, uh, I've started a campaign or a uh, bounty hunt against Twitch, right? So the top level node in my mind map just says that it's Twitch the company, right? Because actually, I know that Twitch 
has a lot of domains, and they're not all named twitch.tv, right? I'm going to discover that in the tool that we just looked at and some other tools we're going to look at. Um, so I'm just going to start filling this out as we're going along, right? So uh, if, I go, if I go look for, uh, you know, Twitch's IP space, I'll add a tree here, and I'll just say IP space here. And then I'll keep, oh, that's not spelled right. Good job. Uh, and I'll keep that range here. Um, I can go look for it in a second. Uh, and then I'll start adding domains on the top level node. Now this doesn't look like much when you start it, but by the end of this, you will have a lot of data that you can start working with in this tree. What this ends up looking like is something like this. Uh, there it is. What it ends up is looking like something like this, where I have nodes of a top level domain that's in scope, uh, Twitch.tv in the upper right-hand side. And now I have lists of subdomains and outputs of tools. And this is how I organize my information. Uh, and basically, how do you eat an elephant with all of these sites that you're finding, all these subdomains? Well, one byte at a time, right? Like, I test each site individually, one site at a time, once I find them. Um, I do an abbreviated methodology for web hacking on each one of these sites once I know that they're real and they're owned by, by Twitch. Uh, and then I just go through things like content discovery, like di dynamic parameter discovery, fuzzing, uh, basic cross-site scripting checks, basic SQL injection checks, default passwords, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I mark them by progress. So if it's green, I've, I'm done with it. I've made a first pass over that domain. Um, and if, a, or actually, if it's green, it didn't have a vulnerability. Um, a check mark is based if I finish the testing on the site or not. So here we have a red entry on the bottom that has no check mark and is red. It means I found a vulnerability, I'm probably still testing on it. Um, orange is like I've put it off till later. Something about that site has caused me to say, I don't want to do this right now. I'm going to put off this work till later because maybe this subdomain has some special technology that I just don't want to dive into right at this second. Um, and I do this for every top level domain. So down here you can see that Twitch actually owns Justin Todd TV. Uh, CurseForge, they also own, own Curse, Twitch App, and Curse App. Those are all top-level domains they own, and I'm going to do this same recon methodology for each one of those top-level domains. All right. So, discovering new targets. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Yeah, so Shodan was the last thing. So now, uh, now that I have some IP space, right? Shodan is giving me some information. I have maybe the main uh, IP space stuff uh, from just Twitch.tv, which I know is their main site. Um, and then, you know, I have some other information that maybe I got other places. Um, now I want to see if maybe they have uh, some different kinds of brands, uh, not just Twitch.tv and maybe not just having their IP ranges. I want to find out if Twitch has acquired anyone really recently. Um, I want to see where they're linking to off their main site. So there's a lot of good tools to do this. And I want to do some tracker analysis of their ad and analytics because this will reveal other places where they're using those ad and analytics and I can add those because they're probably related to Twitch. So acquisitions is pretty simple. This hasn't changed much in the last year. Crunchbase is still the number one place to go to find acquisition data. A lot of day traders use Crunchbase to figure out information on uh, trading for or investing in companies, startups, whatever. Um, it also has a lot of news. But the subsection that says acquisitions, you can drill down into any company and see uh, pretty concretely who they've acquired. And it's updated really, really frequently. Um, so here you can see in the last few years, Tesla has acquired Grauman Engineering. Solar City and Riviera Tool. Now, when you take over an organization like this, if you're a big parent organization, you probably decommission all of their IP space and probably their servers. Uh, you dead link all of their DNS entries or remove them all together. You nuke all their CNAMs. Um, but really, that doesn't actually happen 100%. They probably still have some cloud infrastructure out there that they forgot was up and running. They have probably customer data leaked some places. This happens all the time. So if you're a wide scope program like Tesla who says, we care about all security vulnerabilities on our bounty, um, I look at these two. I look at SolarCity. I look at you know, Riviera Tool to see if these domains, when the, use, when the websites used to exist, you know, reveal some type of sites that maybe have vulnerabilities in them. So link discovery is this idea of finding out what the main site is linking to. And there's often a lot of uh, links that are outgoing from a website or even incoming. Um, and you can do this recursive link discovery in a tool called Burp Suite. How many of you used Burp Suite before? Very good. All right, so we're going to do this real quick. Uh, and we'll try it on Twitch, see if it works, if the demo gods will love me. I'm going to boot, boot up my uh, Burp testing profile here. And put burp on the right. 
when I started this morning, my license had expired. I had to buy a new license. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is painful. All right. So now we have burp. And our browser on the left. And let's just, let's do some things before we start. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that uh, spider in burp is not passively spidering as I'm browsing. I don't want to do that. I just want to instrument a certain thing right now. So I'm going to disable passive spidering as you browse. Uh, I'm going to say max link depth for this exercise is 1 in burp. And max parameters that I want to crawl is 25. Uh, and then I'm going to say when it sees a form, a login form, um, usually burp prompts for guidance. This is super annoying if you've ever used burp before. Um, so uh, you can either say don't submit login forms or you can say automatically submit these credentials. Um, I usually for this exercise choose don't submit login forms. Number of threads is fine. Um, and then forms in, in general, I'm just not going to submit forms for this spider. So I've set up my burp spider settings here. And now I'm going to set up some scope. So if I go to the target tab and I go to scope, um, really what I want to check out first is, uh, is adding anything that I know says Twitch. Now Burp has um, a little bit of different functionality in the last year that they've launched. So you have the verbatim ability to add a real domain or URL here to add in scope. And normally when you right click on a site and add something to scope, um, that's what it's doing. I don't actually care about that because um, I, I don't know any domains except for the main one yet that I want in scope. What I actually want to do is uh, basically say anything that has the keyword Twitch is going to be in scope for this project. So if you click this, block, this box right here that says use advanced scope control, you can say add and you don't have to anymore supply a fully qualified URL. So here I can just now say Twitch and just say OK. And so now that becomes my scope for this project. Um, I'll say yes here. Do I want to limit history for just that thing? OK, so now let's go to twitch.tv. All right, make sure burps on. Oh, that was the dude streaming. My bad. That really confused me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So we're now proxying Twitch through Burp. You can see that Interceptor has, uh, or Intercept has said, yo, there's traffic coming through here. So we're going to turn Intercept off and just let everything go through and then go back to our sitemap. All right. So already, just by visiting the main page, we have some subdomains that are hot linked off of the main page. And the idea here of this link discovery idea is we're going to iteratively now spider everything we find uh, to find more subdomains. So first, let's just choose uh, gkl.twitch. We'll add this to, or we'll add basically uh, spider this. Oh, there we go, twitch.tv. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just spider everything, if, if possible. Yeah, right click, spider here. All right, already the spider has started to return a whole bunch of content for link stuff, not just on twitch.tv now, but also the things we just chose a second ago. So um, now we start to get a pretty good map of, uh, of stuff that Twitch is is related to. Now, because I am parsing on a keyword, we're also getting the benefit of seeing what vendors they integrate here, right? Some of these are not twitch.tv domains. They're uh, ad systems some, or like other things that have Twitch in the URL or the domain, um, which can be pretty useful for us to know to gather information on, on the target. So the idea here is, is recursively, I would start selecting this and keep on spidering until I built out a huge map of domains. Um, and those would go on my list of things to test. I need to test every single one of these things, which seems like a daunting task, but if you abbreviate your web testing methodology, uh, you can absolutely do it. Um, I had a bounty the other day that was upwards of, uh, I think, 5,000 found live hosts. Um, and I spent, well, this wasn't the other day, it was the other month. I spent about a month on it, and I think I made 20 grand in a month. So it's not bad. So, um, okay. So you would then select all these, spider these. How do you take this information, add it to your mind map, or just make it in a list so you can feed it to other tools? Burp actually doesn't have a copy all targets function, which I hope they, they do pretty soon. Um, but the, what you have to do is actually you have to have the pro version, and you select everything here. And you right click, and you say engagement tools, um, analyze target. And analyze target builds you this report PDF report of all the domains and information about what dynamic parameters they have. And this is, you know, burp usage. Uh, but if you save the report, here I won't do it right now, but if you save the report, it gives you a PDF report. And this is the most effective way to just copy and paste the list of targets that you had on the left hand side right there. It's just, 
There just doesn't exist a function to copy all targets on the left-hand side of Burp. So save this as a PDF, open the PDF, copy the table, and dump it into something else. Any questions? No. All right. Quite a few hosts for, for Twitch. What? Yes. Yeah, to do that, you need to have the professional version of Burp, unfortunately. Yeah, that doesn't exist in free. All right, so, yes. You can use what? Zap for what? Oh, zap, not zap, yeah. Um, good question. I don't think that they have that function either, but you can use zap for everything in here. The same, same stuff happened with zap. Zap has a spider. In fact, zap spider right now might be arguably better than Zerp's, uh, Burp's because it handles JavaScript really well. Um, although Burp just released a, a blog really recently that they're updating their whole spider engine to just be awesome. I'm so excited about that. So uh, maybe that will change in you know a couple of weeks. But Zap will abs absolutely work for this workflow as well, or as well as like uh, uh, Charles and some of the other interception proxies. All right, we will nuke these. All right, so that was a demo for link discovery. Oh, not share. We won't present. Cool. All right, so someone said uh, who is data or reverse who has data uh, is a method where we could start to find uh, related domains or IP space of some of our targets. Now, this is a tool that's relatively new called DomLink. Um, it's written by a guy named Vincent Yu. Uh, he does this really cool Twitter thing called uh, Red Team Tips. Uh, he has over like 200 Red Team Tips that he tweets out every other day or something like that. And there's some really useful nuggets in there if you're doing red teaming or just bug bounty in general. But he created this tool that's based off of this site called Huoxi. Uh, Huoxi is a website that offers an API that's really cheap to access for, uh, and it has a free version, it has, a, has a free number of queries you can do, it, do to it for reverse who is data. So he created a tool that will recursively uh, basically look at uh, a couple of things for an organization. Mostly the most useful one is organization name. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show this real quick and what this looks like. So this will query this Huoxy database, this tool will, um, with an API key that you sign up for it. You can do, I think, 150 queries before your free version is gone. Um, and it'll help you um, basically search for any site that has the registered company name of whoever registered your main target. So let's see if this works for, for Twitch. I'll make this bigger in a second, one second. Oh, caps lock was on. Uber hacker up here, can't get in with caps lock. <laughs> okay, all right, so I'm on my test box. So let's see the tools, and I think DOM link is where I'm putting all this stuff. Okay, so do Python. Uh, DOM link. Let's see how Twitch has their, uh, who is information set up Twitch. Dot TV dash C. Okay, Let's see if this works. Okay, so their registrant name is Twitch Interactive Inc., which I think is actually correct, right? So this tool is gonna ask me, do you want me to check the whole database for Twitch Interactive Inc. and give you back what domains those are? So I'm gonna say yes. Now this can get iteratively recursive because they might have actually registered under Twitch or Twitch Interactive or Twitch Engineering. like. People register stuff very weirdly. There's no, there's, in a lot of companies, there's not like a standard way that you do this unless you're very patent down with how your registration works. So a lot of the times, it will, it will actually alert me on a couple of these. It'll say, I found five with the keyword Twitch in them. Maybe we should check all of these out. But for right now, I'm just gonna say yes. And here we go. So we have a ton of host data for other sites that are Twitchy. Uh, Wow. TwitchCon, obviously their conference, so they host a domain for that, that's in scope. Um, why TwitchCon, Twitch with a three, some, they might be parking some of these, um, but that's okay, I still wanna check them out. Um, 
One time when I did this, um, I used a keyword for uh, a large uh, manufacturer. And um, what I ended up finding was a domain that looked nothing like any of the other domains I'd seen or any other brands, um, but they had indeed registered it with the same company name. It turned out that the company was hosting um, basically a whole bunch of new school, well, new school for them, um, portals for code repositories. Basically Jira, Jenkins, all kinds of CI CD stuff. Um, and they thought that the protection to this was that ne they never told anyone about the URL. Like it was only internal, right? It's security by obscurity. So they thought that they didn't need to put authentication on it. So I walked in, stole all their source code, passwords, rooted the Jenkins server through script console, um, and that was really just right out of this tool. So this can be really useful to find targets. Twitch, Amazon, Twitch, yeah. So, so now you have this output. Now what do you do with this output? I mean, basically it's as simple as copying and pasting it into um, the mind map. So if I go back here, this is where the fun starts. So each one of these should get a node if copy and paste works. Yeah, okay. Well, you get the idea. Each one of these should get a node. Twitch.tv, Justin.tv, uh, TwitchCon, everyone should get a node. All right, let's go back to presentation. It's okay so far? Useful? Yeah? Okay, cool. Questions? Question, yeah. Um, it's a different database. It's, re it's a reverse Whois focused database, and they're parsing more fields in the Whois information than that site is. Um, I've used both. Uh, I find this one to be way more effective. So, yeah. Um, okay, so now we also want to find maybe. Uh, oh, we're still on this track of trying to find top-level domains, acquisitions, other sites that are related um, to Twitch because they will be in scope for a large scope bounty. Uh, now, every company use ads and analytics tags, right? Yes. You also do Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. Through you can do it through that same one, Huoxi or that tool, Dom. Like it has multiple options. You can specify you want to search by company keyword. You can specify registrant name. You can specify uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, just check into the, like, the stuff of that one, yeah. Um, so built with uh, basically is this company that does uh, technology profiling um, and ad and analytics analytics. Uh, basically, they check out every site on the internet. They spider, spider it by looking at their leftover source snippets or text files or just default configurations of some frameworks. They know. Um, that your site is running fastly and uh, you know is hosted you know with this X server technology and is using these JavaScript frameworks and they also know what an ad and analytics uh, you're using by the format of the key that you embed in the web page. Now we can use this to our advantage because if you're a company like Twitch, you have a new Relic key and you have a Google Analytics key or some of these other keys. Now, luckily for us, they allow us to look at these relationships between sites. So here I've drilled down into Twitch's. And those are their analytics keys on the middle pane right there. I can click on any of those and see where else their analytics keys showed up on the internet, what other sites are in the built with database. Uh, so this allows me to find brand new stuff that I might not have seen before, like binny.tv and um, you know, Booth the Bun. These are all streamers that actually Twitch has um, promoted so much that uh, they now have their own Twitch hosted sites. And so uh, these might be in scope for the bounty. They might be custom code. You never know. So. Uh, so this is really this is really advanced. So um, basically, to do this, uh, you use the built with. Um, you can go to the built with site and just do a search on their uh, on their site, or you can use the Chrome extension, which I can show you now. So uh, in my browser up here, if I go to Twitch again, or actually I'll do it in my testing profile. Actually, in here. No, nope, that's not my testing profile. Did I close it? Yeah, I close it. There it is. Okay. So now that I'm at Twitch, built with, the extension is installed. It's just in the Chrome store. You can click it. Um, maybe Burke's messing it up real quick. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Just takes a little longer because it's getting proxied. So here you can see that uh, I get some tech. I get some tech information, and this is useful in hacking anyway to find out the stack they're using, what JavaScript frameworks they're using, and you can drill down into this. Um, Go back there, sorry. 
This is also very useful in other parts of the methodology, is knowing what they run, right? Because you're going to look for O days in frameworks they use or whatever. So this is useful. But then if you go to the second tab up here, uh, yeah, question. Uh, Wappalyzer doesn't do any of the admin analytics tracking. It just does uh, technology profiling. So it'll do like, uh, it'll do just as good of a job, if not, um, if not a better job uh, than built with. But it's yeah, it's limited on the other functions. So let's try on the website. Yeah, another question. Yeah. So that's the problem, right? I would have scaled it if I could. The problem with built with is that it's it's a paid tool. They really want you to pay for it. Um, so actually, it looks like they just updated it <laughs> right when I was doing this presentation. So it used to work right inside the bookmarklet. Now it looks like I have to log in with a free account to get the relationship information or maybe use the search on the website. They have an API. It's expensive. It's really expensive to use the API. Um, but I don't know of anyone else doing this analytics tracking, the analytics code tracking across multiple domains. So kind of stuck with it right now if I want to use this method. If anybody else knows of anything cool like that, I would love to know. So um, let's, try, let's try the main site. Oh, that's all right. All right, here we go. All right, so relationship of twitch.tv, I can see that here's their UA code right here, or their Google Analytics code, and if I click on that, now I get the domain information. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So here on the left-hand side, I can see related domains. I also get a heat map over here of like how much they're related, although I'll be honest, I don't really know how to read this graph really well yet, but uh, I use the data from the table most often. So. Star of the tree, you know, this is kind of the st same stuff we were looking at before. Some guild sites, faceless.tv. Um, this happens a lot, actually, is what happened with this kind of linked analysis. Uh, if they're going to do a beta product and they haven't even let anybody know about it, a lot of times I can look at this data and know that they're doing that data product. Like, I knew way before some video games had even launched or gone into beta that Twitch had already partnered with them and got sites ready for them and already integrated the analytics code into the page, and I end up, like, knowing beforehand. Not really useful for a hunter, but exciting for a gamer, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. You don't. You have to visit them. Um, the indicators, I wouldn't say of compromise, but the indicators of ownership are usually the site has a privacy policy that links back to Twitch or a, a trademark that links back to Twitch in the footer. That's how I usually know that these are related. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep, you could use DNS registration information. You could go back to the who is information too and just verify that these ones match, you know, who is look up and stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes I'm reckless enough that I don't do that, um, but you know, it just depends. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, go back to presentation mode. All right. All right, so that's tracker analysis basically. So other things that you can just do are the things we just talked about. So trademarks exist across. Uh, many sites, right? You have to embed your trademark and policy and privacy policy in any site that you launch for a business nowadays. Um, they protect you legally. Uh, so searching for things like uh, Tesla C2016, Tesla C2015, Tesla C2017, and then in URL colon Tesla is a quick Google dork to try to find some sites that are related to uh, Tesla. Yes? How do you identify sites that are infringing on a brand I don't look at that, honestly. Um, when I'm doing bounty hunter, I, I, bounty hunting stuff, I don't, I don't care as much. So, I mean, that's a horrible answer, but yeah, I just like. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would report it. Like, I mean, I have had instances before where like I found a site, it has the privacy policy, but I can see it's obviously not managed by uh, the company. Um, it's a third party. It's vulnerable to something. Like I, I picked up right away. It has like some kind of search functionality or reflected like text, and it turns out to be vulnerable across site scripting. Um, you know, in a bug bounty situation, I just ping the customer and I say, I found this site. 
It should be in scope because you have a wide scope program, but also might be in scope because I don't know if you own it. They have your trademark on it. I just say those words. A lot of times they'll be like, thank you. We'll contact the owner of the service. We think we knew who it is. And they'll usually award me a bounty for just having found something that they had no idea was up or had lost track of. So. Okay, so now we've done IPs and brands and like related sites. So now we're gonna get into discovering subdomains. So we talked about subdomain enumeration, right? Like finding, now that we have tesla.com or twitch.tv, those are top level domains. Now we wanna start finding subdomains of those sites. And those can individually map to IPs and be their own applications, which all are in scope for bounty hunting and red teaming. Um, so really, there's two methods to enumerate subdomains. One is subdomain scraping, and the other is subdomain brute forcing. Now, subdomain scraping is the idea of taking search engines, databases, census, Baidu, DNS databases, uh, SSL certificate databases, uh, even virus total, Wayback Machine. There's about 65 total sites um, around the internet that harvest large sets of data about domains, or maybe they're not even really made for that, they're made for other things, but allow us to do searches to find references to domains. Um, and they all, in some way or another, offer access to an API or can be scraped pretty easily by some Python um, to return. So uh, this is relatively new, actually. We weren't doing a ton of this in pen testing until like the last couple years, actually. Nobody was really looking at scraped information off the internet to, to, to identify subdomains and maybe assets of a company in a red team engagement. Um, but uh, now it's all the rage. This is actually one of the best methods to find subdomains and secret sauce of, of your clients or your bug bounty targets. So there's a ton of sources. Um, what happens is really there's been two advents. One was, uh, one was a tool called Sublister, which was one that everybody used for a really long time. Um, and it was, it was maintained for a while, then kind of fell off, wasn't really maintained. And then two authors really recently uh, released two tools um, that are epically good. And so, they each have different sources and they each have different features and functions. Uh, so I can't decide which one I want to use in my methodology if I, would, if I would be asked to use one tool. So I just script them both together. When I started that scan at the beginning of the, uh, at the, beginning of the presentation, that's just some bash in the background running concurrently this tool AMAS and the next tool I'm going to talk about, Subfinder. And that's the reason the tool takes so long is because it's scraping all these sites right now. So this is a run of AMAS against Netflix, uh, who also has a bounty, public bounty. Um, and what it does, it goes out to, I think, between AMAS and Subfinder, 65 sources, I think. Um, and it also offers some, some cool stuff like permutation scanning. So first thing it'll do is it'll scrape all those sources for references to Netflix.com. And then it'll tell you, on this page, I found media.netflix.com and geo.netflix.com. And exout104.netflix.com, I have no idea what that is. Um, and so it'll give you back a list of now targets. And you can see in this methodology, for a, a big company, you're starting to gather hundreds of targets that you can go after, which for a bug bounty hunter is, is good, right? You can hack the main site or you can focus on these other sites. There's really no limit to the kind of stuff you can find. Um, a lot of my buddies are on the Walmart red team and uh, they use the same methodology, this recon methodology to find stuff that's just been left out there, especially when they acquire a new company. They do the same stuff, same enumeration. Uh, so the other helpers that this tool has is it includes some reverse DNS stuff, but also has what's called permutation scanning. So you see here, the second result here was media.netflix.com on the right hand side from this tool. Um, and that's great. So what it'll do is it'll add common prefixes to that subdomain, like uh, one-media.com, or user, or dev, or prod, or whatever, that uh, media.com, and then it'll try dash, and it will append keywords and a dash and a dot to try to find additional hosts um, that are related to that subdomain, and see if they resolve, and if it does resolve, add it to the list. And so this is called uh, permutation scanning in subdomain enumeration, and so uh, AMAS includes a function to do this. So the other one is Subfinder, written by Iceman. Um, awesome hacker name, I love it. Uh, and this one has uh, a multi-resolver brute forcer uh, built in. So if you want to do brute forcing and subdomain scraping via the same tool, um, you can use Subfinder. Um, and it's pretty efficient. Uh, it also can output in JSON, so you can feed some of this stuff to other tools. Um, especially if you're using something like Aquatone, Subfinder uh, supports now Aquatone output. So if you wanted to use Subfinder for the discovery instead of Aquatone, which is a framework for OSINT, 
that finds the same kind of stuff. Uh, you can basically take the output of this, put it into Aquatone, and then use Aquatone for the later phases of uh, what he calls a domain flyover. But really, it's just subdomain analysis. So I used to have a fancy table saying like what was better about each tool when it was sublister and some other ones like Enumall, which is a tool I wrote. I completely deprecated my own tool. I just want to use what works. Um, Aquatone, sublister, and anything else for scraping. Uh, but it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, Subfinder, AMAS are the two tools you want to use. They're the best in breed right now, and they will be for quite a while. They handle the most sources, and they're the most effective. Okay, so that's subdomain scraping. Now you have subdomain brute forcing. How am I doing on time? I have five minutes? Oh, God. Okay. Uh, subdomain brute forcing is the idea that you just try to resolve a whole bunch of random stuff, like admin.twitch.tv.com, or twitch.tv, and media.twitch.tv. And if you get a, res a resolve, uh, it means that site exists, or some kind of DNS redirect, right? Uh, and um, this is time consuming. Brute forcing anything, passwords or DNS entries is, is time consuming. And pen testing used to take a long time. There are newer tools nowadays, and the one we're going to talk about is MassScan. Um, MassScan, or MassDNS, sorry, MassDNS is the one we're going to talk about. MassDNS used to take what used to take, or what used to take a day to do, or maybe a week to do, with a large list of words to try to brute force subdomains. I just cut that time down into a minute and 24 seconds. And how it did this is it's written in C, first of all, very fast. Um, and then it uses what's called multi-resolvers. Basically, uh, instead of using one DNS resolver to do that uh, resolution, it cuts it into groups of 10 resolvers and then distributes your word list across 10 resolvers and then brings it all back to you in the same tool. Um, so it drastically cuts down the time um, to do this type of brute force. A one million line subdomain dictionary runs in one minute and 24 seconds. That's unheard of. So uh, this is kind of what everyone's using right now. Um, so what about those word lists? Well, this is every, on the right, every tool that I've ever known in my pen testing career, bug hunting career, that ever existed for subdomain brute forcing. Uh, Fierce, a lot of people used Fierce for a long time. Knock, like a whole bunch of tools came out for subdomain brute forcing over the last 10 years. They all had different word lists, and then individual projects came out with word lists to try to do subdomain brute forcing. Um, I basically catted and unique them into this one list called all.txt, and this is what I use with MassDNS. This is what I feed MassDNS with. Oh, okay, I'm fine. They said I could stay a little while. Okay. Um, so there's some other newer kind of tools um, or kind of newer projects out there. One is called CommonSpeak. What CommonSpeak is is they used BigQuery on a whole bunch of sites to parse out uh, their subdomain structure and their URL structure. Now, um, the subdomain data is awesome. Like, uh, it actually really gives you keywords and terms to look up subdomain data. Um, that is pretty new, right? They, they went out and they analyzed Hacker News and HTTP Archive and Stack Overflow. overflow. Um, and basically, if you think about it, they're just spidering these sites. And every time they see a URL mentioned or a, a domain mentioned, they capture the subdomain and add it to a list and then do some analytics on it. And they say, all right, new school companies are probably using these names for their subdomains. Um, so if it totally became fashionable to name your subdomains after characters in Harry Potter, if Harry Potter made a resurgence, Doing a BigQuery result uh, against one of these sites might tell you that that's become fashionable again. This is how people name their subdomains, which is almost like language analysis added to subdomain, subdomain enumeration. They also tried to do the same thing with URL data and how uh, URLs are structured, like their URL path. Um, this has been less useful for me, but I'm still waiting for the author to like sell me his dream on like why this is super useful, because when I looked at it, it's very application specific, right? Everybody has a different URL path. There's not many common occurrences I see unless you're using a purchase software or a license software or something like that. So, um, but the subdomain data is awesome. I've integrated into the all.txt file, so it's in there now. So you really, you could just use the all.txt file. Any questions? Yeah? All right. Um, so other ways to find subdomain data. So if you, if you have question. No, he's taking a picture. All right. So if you have uh, if you have DNS, um, or sorry, if you have uh, DNS enabled, 
Um, there's this idea of how DNSSEC links to the next subdomain um, set up for your organization. And I, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly how this works. I'm not a DNSSEC expert. Maybe someone in this room knows this better. But I know that they do link in reference to each other when you set up DNSSEC. So there's this idea of what's called NSEC walking. And there's three tools for this, LDNS utils, NSEC walker, and NSEC map. Um, and what they do is they basically iteratively go through every domain that you hand it, the first one, and look for the next reference one in the NSEC chain. Um, and basically, what happens when you run one of these tools is you get kind of an old school looking DNS zone transfer, uh, which is amazing because nobody lets you do that anymore. And if they let you do that, a lot of this would be, you know, moot. Like, if I had a zone transfer, great. Like, give me, give me all that. Um, so if they have DNSSEC enabled, they can, uh, they, you can use one of these tools. There's a whole presentation about it that uh, Bharat Kumar, um, he did at the Bug Crack Conference Level Up two years ago, where he walked through doing all of this. It's called Esoteric Subdomain Enumeration Techniques, which was excellent. I really loved it. Um, other ways that you can search for domains is searching GitHub or GitLab or you know, sources you know, like that. Um, and you can also just do some, some Google dorking. So. All right, so now we've got a giant list of targets in our scope or our you know, campaign for Red Team or Pug County you know, thing. So what do we do now? Well, it's very general. Like in pen testing, you do port scanning, except for, for a long time we were using Nmap, which nothing against Nmap, but it's slow. It's really slow. Um, and it's a great tool, and I use it in the methodology, but just in a different place. Uh, so things like ZMAP and MassScan are infinitely faster to just do a general port scan. Um, so here, uh, MassScan, to do a full port scan of a large target's ASN, takes about 11 minutes to finish, and it's on 65,000 hosts, right? That's super fast for a port scan. Um, you know, I'm running this on a mid-tier digital ocean box, so like, uh, also not the most bandwidth that I'm working with. But um, NMAP would have taken a week. Right. I remember when I was doing pen testing uh, full time when I was like just a scrub, uh, we would kick off this really ugly Python script and, uh, and it would have to kick off Nmap at the beginning of the script for a large company's domain and then we'd come back four days later and it would have finally completed. Now Nmap has gotten a lot of tuning to, to get faster. Um, there has been a lot of tuning, but MassScan still blows it out of the water. So what I do is I do the initial port scanning with MassScan, the fast port scanning of the whole IP or of the IP with every port, right? The full range of one to 65,535. And then, if that tells me a port is open, then I feed that to Nmap. And Nmap only gets the ports I know I'm open, and then I use Nmap because it's stronger in other areas. It allows you to do version scanning. It allows you to add Nmap scripting engine checks. And so, I'll feed the mass scan output to Nmap. And as you can see, this is a methodology that can obviously be automated, right? You can script all this together. Yes? Yes, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a typo, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes? Yes, sometimes it does come back with false positives that are asynchronous, um, because it's asynchronous. Uh, really, I don't have a great way around that right now. Um, so, like, when I get back that data of port data, what it'll look like in my automation um, is, is that it like, looks like every port is open on a box and uh, with a mass scan, and it actually like, since I'm logging the port scan to a flat file, that flat file ends up being like a, like a huge amount of megabytes, and it slows down my tool. I'm still trying to figure out a way to like not do that. Um, so it's, it's in my issues list at home. Um, but yeah, I mean, it happens less often nowadays. Like, I think that if you tune mass scan really well, you can get around some of it, so, yeah. Yes? Yes, this is true. Uh, okay, so the question was a lot of places blacklist you when you start doing scanning, right? Um, this is a running joke. I don't know if you've heard it before. Like, what happens here is a lot of the cloud-based WAFs, um, Akamai and Cloudflare and some other ones, when you start getting into port scanning or when you start requesting a lot of web requests against a host or you even send one iota of attack traffic to the site, They'll put you on this global blacklist, which will blacklist your whole house. And then your wife, my wife, will come to me and be like, why can't I get to Amazon? Why can't I get to United? I'm, literally, she was trying to go to a funeral with, uh, for her mom's mom, and uh, she couldn't register a plane ticket because I'd blacklisted our house, our IP, on this global blacklist. So um, this, is, this is a running thing. 
Uh, I test over a VPN all the time now, and I make sure to have a, a VPN that has a quick proxy switch fiction or uh, function. So uh, I use IPVanish because IPVanish has a whole bunch of functions that I like, like the checkbox that won't let you connect to the internet unless you have the, the VPN enabled, uh, and it also has a button that just says quickly change IP. So once I get blacklisted from one, I'll just switch to another. But uh, I don't test over my home network anymore. So VPN, yeah. Okay. Questions? Oh, okay. All right. So now you've got back some port scan data. Immediately, you're going to start to notice things that are interesting here. Obviously, you're going to notice the 443s and the 80s, which are what we're going to test for web testing. But you're also going to start to notice remote, administra remote administration protocols and database servers and things like that. All of these can be brute forced uh, with password lists. And so this is the part that gets, you know, you've got to make sure you have permission at this point. Um, so when you do the mass scan uh, and you get the output back, then you, then you serve it to uh, Nmap. And Nmap, with Nmap, you do the slash OG flag to get back uh, the greppable output. What you can do with the greppable output of a service scan from uh, Nmap is feed it to this tool called Brute Spray. And Brute Spray is pretty cool. It takes the Nmap GMAP file, or GNMAP file, and it will parse it for all remote administration protocols. Uh, and using, uh, I think it's Medusa's, the core technology it's using under, it will brute force everything in that GNMAP file for credentials. Um, and it'll do it concurrently, which is kind of useful. Um, so here I've iterated, or I've, I've specified a password list. Uh, it comes with a default user and password list. This is honestly enough for me. I'm not trying to hardcore brute force into stuff. Like, that's usually not even scope for the bug bounty. Um, in red teaming it is. So, you know, maybe you want to use a more advanced username and password file list here. A lot exist out there. Sec list is probably one of the best ones that you could find um, for password and, and um, username lists. Um, but I'll just use the default one here, and I'll run this after the mask scan and Nmap finishes. Um, it does this. Uh, so it locates the file, and you can see that inside of my GNMAP file, it identified nine FTP services, uh, eight SMTP, um, uh, actually nine SMTP, eight SSH hosts, one Telnet, and one, uh, one MySQL. Uh, and it'll brute force all of these for common usernames and passwords, and alert me when it finds it. So then I have now started to look at remote administration protocols, but now I have all of this data for websites, 443 and 80. Um, these are actually what I spend a majority of my time testing on a bug bounty is websites, uh, but I have so many now. I have hundreds of domains for a large scope company. Like if, what's the largest company you could ever think of? If in, Microsoft. Accenture and Microsoft, right? You do this analysis for Accenture and Microsoft, you're getting back like, I would say, well, I know for Microsoft, it's in, the, it's in the like thousands of live hosts that you're looking at, right? And I don't know how many of you have ever done a campaign against a thousand hosts. It's a lot of work. Um, and to really know where to start, you could start at the top of the list looking at those hosts, uh, but also you could do this method, this method of kind of visual identification. So what you do is you use a tool called Eyewitness. There's other tools that do this. Aquatone does this as well. Um, there's another tool called HTTP Screenshot, and there's another tool that I just identified that somebody told me outside in the Recon Village uh, tables about that's even better for this, but I haven't tried it yet, so it's at the end of the presentation. The idea is you find some tool that visits all your URLs or domains and takes a screenshot. That's all it does. Takes a screenshot, dumps it in a folder. Now you can open up that folder with large thumbnails enabled or whatever, and just look through and kind of eyeball, like, yeah, that's, that redirected to the main site. I don't care about that. This redirected to a help site. Kind of don't care about this. Oh, this looks like an admin backend login. Really care about that, right? And so you visually, I start identifying things that you care about out of this large list, and that helps you prioritize what you test first so you get kind of return on your time. Um, what Eyewitness did that I liked a lot is you can feed it just a list of domains and not whether it's HTTP or HTTPS. Um, and so this tool, uh, Eyewitness in specific, would try both for me. I didn't have to recreate multiple lists with HTTP and HTTPS and then feed it to the tool. The tool did it for me. But it's also kind of slow. These sometimes are prone to error, these tools taking screenshots, because they're using things like PhantomJS, which is just kind of a garbage fire sometimes. Um, so uh, yeah, you just have to take it with a grain of salt that maybe it, you'll get some false negatives in this idea. I probably still recommend, like, uh, when I'm doing this against a smaller target, if I have less than 100 hosts that I found, I'm just loading all that in a browser and just visiting the pages myself uh, using some 
Chrome plugins. If it's over 100 hosts, then I'll do something like this and go try to automatically uh, do the screenshot method. Yes? Yes, it is. Uh, in Eyewitness, they have that function where you can um, dynamically add a set of ports to the end of the domain, yeah. Which I actually don't think a lot of the other tools that are trying to do this have supported yet, so, yeah. Yeah, like if they were running an SSL, uh, HTTPS service on another port, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this one, um, this one is kind of new and is actually like really simple, but uh, who here has used Wayback Machine? Oh, yes, okay. It's one of my favorite sites. Archive.org and Wayback Machine are awesome. Um, if you've never used them before, what they are is a website that takes periodic snapshots of most sites on the internet that they can find. Um, and then they will take these snapshots and show you the front page or maybe several pages on that site uh, with a date and time stamp and they keep the image up there. And so um, what you can do is when you start going to these sites, what you're going to notice is that a lot of them are like infrastructure that's not serving a real web page. There's no application. It's, it's really either an API or some kind of infrastructure that just needs to be hosted, but it's hosting other ports and a web server for no apparent reason. Um, so you'll notice that when you're going through your testing, you'll get like a lot of blank pages or like stuff that looks like it's been nuked but once was there, like a lot of content. Uh, so what you can do is you can go and look in the web archive history and see was there one sensitive content there. This is actually um, how a buddy of mine, Brett, like I, I had done this and been successful in a couple cases, uh, but a buddy of mine, Brett, who's a bug bounty hunter, was like, it was kind of nice to see that he's found some really high impact vulnerabilities using this methodology. So. You know, when you do this, how do you automate it, right? Well, there's some tools to do it. There's one called uh, Back Unifier and another one called Recon Cat that supports scraping the links to the image um, of the history of the site that you're looking way back into. Um, and so uh, these kind of get integrated into your methodology when you see sites that have little content on them or look like they used to be sensitive but have since been fixed. You go to their Wayback enumeration and then bingo, it's like a configuration page that has like a private API key that's still being used. And they thought that removing the web page was the solution, but actually the content was cached on the internet. So. All right, so we did Wayback enumeration, we did visual identification. All right, so now for each one of these sites, right, I probably have a node in my mind map for all of them and I just start going on the list and this is what I do. Um, the first thing is I identify the platform with built with, right, the Chrome plugin. Um, I have a Python script that I'm gonna release. I just have one bug to fix because they change the API all the time, um, and I need to now change it to do use a free account. Uh, but I have a Python script I built that will scrape built with and give you the technology profile back for your site, so you can integrate it into your own tools. I'll release that uh, afterwards and maybe tweet about it on my Twitter. Um, or you can use Wappalizer. Um, which is somebody mentioned. There's another one called WhatWeb, which is also a technology profiling script. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, so they're all pretty good. At this point, I want to see what my target runs, my target application. What does it run? Like ASP.NET, are we looking at PHP? What JavaScript frameworks? Like I want to start getting that information so I know, well, ASP.NET has request validation, so cross-site scripting not really going to be super, success so super successful for many, many times, unless I'm looking at a custom piece of code or something like that. Um, PHP, you know, very prone to path traversal attacks or command injection and stuff like that, old school vulnerabilities. So I gotta put like my 1990s hat on and be like, all right, I'm ready to attack PHP. Um, so, uh, so this gives me that information, the built width. Um, and then also there's another one called retire.js, which is super cool, which will uh, give you the full version length of all their JavaScript libraries, which is easy, easily cross-referenceable with has there been any vulnerabilities since the version or since the version they're using. So immediately I know if they're using outdated um, JavaScript libraries and if there's cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in those or anything else. There's also a newer-ish plugin which is called uh, Vuln Scanner, uh, Burp Vulner Scanner, and um, you load it into Burp and it basically does the same thing that retire.js does, but except for the server stack. So if you think like Nmap gives you, or Nmap not, if you think like Nessus, when you do a Nessus scan, it comes back and it says, this server software is this version because I know by the header or I identified that there was still an install file left or something, I know it's this version, and that version had a vulnerability in it. This does this through burp. So you set this up here, and every time you visit a new site, this looks at those key indicators and says, yeah, this is old. It probably has a CVE associated to it. You should probably go check to see if that's exploitable. 
All right, so I'm on a main site. I technology profiled it. You know, I kind of know what I'm going up against. I've, uh, I've maybe found some CVEs that I have to identify. The next big hurdle is parsing JavaScript. Uh, so sites that are, you know, well, every site nowadays is using heavy JavaScript, right? Like, and Dynamic Spiders and even Burp in its current incarnation is just not good at traversing JavaScript. It's, uh, no technology is really great at it. Um, so to be great at this, I have to add separate tools to my methodology. Uh, so Zap is actually really good for this. Zap's Ajax Spider um, is like a headless browser that will execute a whole bunch of functions on a page um, and basically return you know, uh, how you instrument an application that's heavy JavaScript and allow you to find parameters and even things like DOM-based cross-site scripting um, very easily. So Ajax Spider is, is pretty cool. The other one is called Link Finder, which is a standalone tool that you feed a URL or a list of URLs, and it will go in and pull down uh, anything that it sees in the source code of all the pages of, the, of a spider for full URLs, uh, absolute referenced URLs or dotted URLs, relative URLs uh, with at least one slash, or just references to files. Uh, and it'll go through all of the JavaScript files on a site and parse these out for you and build them into links so that you can visit them inside of either your browser or just directly through burp repeater or something like that. Um, this has been really successful with things like API functions that are maybe loaded on a page in a large piece of JavaScript on how to implement the API, but since you're there just using one function, you're only executing one one hundredth of what the API can do. Well, now you get the paths for all of the API and how you instrument them, and if they haven't basically set up access control, uh, having this mapping and knowing how to work that API without a document uh, is absolutely glorious. Uh, you can find vulnerabilities. Even these things reference configuration files sometimes, like. A lot of times we were missing out on a lot of this information in JavaScript files. Now we're not as much anymore because we have helper tools like Link Finder. Very similar is JS Parser, um, actually written by um, Ben, who was in the room earlier. I don't know if he ever got in, which is sad, um, but he was here. Um, well, help, he helped write this. Uh, does the same thing, parses out paths that are referenced in JavaScript. So how do you feed these tools, those pages? It's pretty simple. You go to your top level target in Burp sitemap. You go to engagement tools. Again, you have to have the pro engagement tools. You say find scripts. Uh, and then you copy the selected URLs that have scripts on them. And then you feed JS parser or link finder that list. And it will automatically go and do its magic and find the URLs that you need to add. All right, so now we've parsed JavaScript. We have a good map of the application, what we're doing, et cetera. Um, Okay, so now we want to do content discovery. The idea of content discovery or direct brute force, uh, content discovery or directory brute forcing, who has done this before? Anybody? Directory brute forcing, no one's used Durbuster before? Or anything, okay, there you go. All right, I was worried there for a second. But the idea here is you have twitch.tv, right? And you've spidered twitch.tv and used it as a user, and you know all these paths and functions that it's executing, but that's not the whole story. Absolutely, there are backend URLs that are used by service staff, like admins. There are usually uh, configuration pages installed by frameworks or login pages installed by frameworks. There's just a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes. Now, uh, how do I know about that when I look at a site? Uh, I do directory brute forcing with something like Durbuster. Now, Durbuster is super old school. Nobody uses Durbuster anymore. Um, we have now moved on to some command line tools that have instrumented the same thing that Durbuster does, uh, but much faster, like GoBuster. Um, GoBuster is one of my go-tos. Another one is DirSearch, which I've been using more lately. And the reason you would use one of these tools over the other is the amount of information it gives you back and control of the directory brute forcing. Five minutes, okay, got it. Um, and so these tools will allow you to go through a large list of directories. The best one right now is Robots Disallowed, written by Daniel over here. Um, he went out and spidered all of the robots.txt files in a large Alexa list, right, or the top Alexa whatever and then built it into a list for us to use because if you think about a robots.txt file, it's what developers don't want you to find, right? Uh, so now we go to every place they don't want to find. They want us to look at stuff, and we look at stuff, and that's what a hacker does. So, uh, so GoBuster and Robots Disallowed. It's pretty win. Um, so this is uh, another list that's pretty good for this. Um, I took Robots Disallowed, and again, every tool that I ever found to do directory brute forcing, and I catted it into one list. Um, it's pretty shit, but it's still pretty good. It works for me. Um, it's a large list, so this will take a long time to run on a target. 
Um, the other idea is that now we have a whole bunch of functions maybe that are linked in JavaScript or we got from other places, uh, but we don't know what parameters they take to actually action the function. Um, so you can brute force parameter names as well once you find a function that seems juicy. And I only ever do this when a parameter seems really juicy, like, you know, like admin equals whatever, you know, transfer data, you know, depreciate user, like whatever. If the keyword seems juicy, I'll do this kind of analysis. Otherwise, this is another time consuming step. Brute forcing anything is time consuming. Um, so there's also a list of the most common, uh, most common parameters on the internet that's integrated into a tool inside of Burp called backslash powered scanner. It's the top parameters that appeared on websites from the Alexa, um, the Alexa list. And you can feed this to a tool called Parameth, which will try to, in, first of all, it'll try to find param, uh, commonly known parameters on a URL or on a script um, or on a REST path. And then uh, it'll feed it this list and try to brute force some if it can't elicit what they are verbatim. So this also works really well. This list, this, back, this backslash powered scanner list called uh, Params, it's in the folder uh, on port Swigger's uh, GitHub. It also is really useful for API fuzzing. So if you're up against a REST path, like you find an API and it's a REST-based API, this list is really good for trying to find REST-based API functions when you're doing a black, a black box web audit. Oh. All right, we're almost done, I swear. All right, so the other one is this idea of auxiliary testing, like just some random stuff I wanted to add in here. Um, a lot of people are committing bad stuff to GitHub. A lot of times, they do it. They just, on accident, they commit passwords, they commit config files, private keys, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so basically what I do in my script uh, when I kicked off the one earlier is the first thing it does is it builds a set of links that are searches to GitHub. So here you can see I have a word here, password, which is actually the one you hit on the most with this kind of analysis. And I build a link here. I say github.com slash search Q. Um, and then my domain is this uh, dollar sign one here, right? That's that's the domain I have. So in this case, it would probably be twitch.com and then plus password. And that's the search. And if I click on this out of my console, it'll take me to GitHub. I have to be logged in. And it'll do a search on all GitHub projects for any code that has been committed that has twitch.tv in it and password equals. Um, and I will find invariably a lot of these. This seems dumb and simple. It happens all the time and is worth a lot of money and bounties and is worth a, it's indicative of a lot of risk to your organization. It just happens. People go spin up custom code projects, they forget they commit it to their own repo, then they even remove it, but the reference is still there in the history, so um, this is a big thing that happens all the time. Um, so I build these links dynamically. While the subdomain scraper and brute force are running in the background, which take a long time, I am manually going to each one of these uh, GitHub searches and trying to find out uh, if they've committed stuff. So I'm trying to stack my activities so that I'm never wasting time. Um, Something new I've started to do is favicon analysis. So the favicons that are associated to you know your little tab and it shows you like, hey, this is the Adobe favicon or whatever. Um, I pull that down from the main website, which I already know usually when starting one of these. I hash it and then I pull down every one I see on every site that's in that port scan, that's in the reference subdomains, um, and I see if the favicon uh, matches. And then I know uh, that for sure that is probably owned by that site. Um, and it might be something indicative that I need to test. So uh, favicon analysis and that methodology is pretty new. Um, I, I confirmed this with a friend of mine who's pretty good at recon. This has actually worked out for him as well. So um, found a couple of referenced IP ranges in the cloud that he didn't know for sure were targets, but then because he could verify via the favicon that they were, uh, was able to get permission to hack them when nobody else had ever seen them um, and found a couple bounties on that. So super cool. Uh, this was the last one I told you about that I actually found out the table out there, Go Grabber. So the idea of uh, HTTP screenshot or any of those screenshot tools. Um, this is a new one. Uh, what I like here is that it's faster. It's written in Go probably, so it's, it's probably faster. Um, and uh, I'm going to try this when I get home. I heard it's pretty good, so I don't really have any data on this. But if you want to go uh, institute something quick, uh, you can try this when, when you get home. So if we go back, this is the total methodology um, wrapped up in kind of bubbles and a cat. Um, the tools that I use with it. And this is iterating all the time. Like this is always changing. Every couple of months something happens where I change up my methodology. Um, I'll wait until all the cameras go down, I guess. <laughs> yes. What? No, what is that? Maybe. Okay. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have any experience with that. I would love to add it to my methodology. Yeah, let's talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's most of it. Let's look at the automation that ran. Okay, so here is, um, holy crap, all right. That was a lot of stuff. So this is my automation. It's just glommy bash, script, bash scripting. It's nothing special, right? So I started on twitch.tv at the top, right? First it says it's running a mass sub finder and mass DNS on twitch.tv, so it's gonna take a while. Then what it gives me is the Crunchbase links for acquisitions for Twitch, so I'll take this and paste it in my browser. Crunchbase uses distill, so I can't automatically pull this down into the command line. I actually have to go visit the page as a human because distill is a really good bot protection. Um, so I just build the link here. I go check it out, I see who they've acquired, I add them to my mind map. Uh, and then I also want to see if there's any like kind of directory structure that Twitch TV maybe uses or it's referenced very highly in Google search results. So this is a Python uh, Google scrape or a Google browser basically. So I um, can't remember the name of it, but I, I institute this basically command line browser to pull back Google queries. Uh, and, uh, and then it gives me links that are referenced on Google for Twitch TV. So I start looking at these things and seeing if there's any strong correlations of sites I should test. Then it builds my GitHub list for me, right? So passwords, so I'll just grab this and copy it or open in, a, open in a browser. So really hope nothing shows up. Uh, so somebody has a project here um, which has a JSON config file with maybe credentials in it. Here's a bot.config for probably scraping Twitch, probably not run by one of their own employees. Here's a conf file that doesn't actually specify a password. Here's somebody who's put a variable in for a password. Uh, user and pass, that's really secure. Um, OAuth, so this is gonna use OAuth. Uh, yeah, so I'll look through multiple pages here. When you're looking through the GitHub output, you can choose best match or recently indexed. Recently indexed will give you, you know, a good view of like if anybody's done something like really recently, um, they, may not, they may have forgot to pull it out. So uh, I will use both. I will look at both sorting views of this data. And I will do this for all of these. Uh, password, ID, RSA, passwd. There's a long list of these that I took from another tool. I can't remember the name. Do you remember, Dan, what the name of that tool is? Yeah, it's some, it's some other GitHub like dorking tool. Um, but it does all, it does some of the analysis automatically, but it was for a different use case. So I took that and put it into building these links. Uh, then the scraper and brute forcer stuff finished processing, and I want to make sure that these sites exist and are not just um, references or taken down, right? Because it's scraping, it's taking information off the internet. Uh, you don't know if that site's maybe taken down, right? So I built my own script to resolve everything, not super fancy, um, and it resolved IP. So a lot of IP or a lot of domains were found. A lot. What? What is it? Oh, okay, I gotta go. So anyway, you can do this at home. This is not fancy scripting. Um, I, get the I get the list of IPs to, to an analyze. I get the links for the sites. I load them in the browser and I test, doing, I test them doing web hunting. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>